guess without further ado, Cynthia. Thanks for everyone for coming. So now we, we all know that you're in the writing room. So I can stop, I can start talking about OpenMS. But first, in case you're curious, I, as he said, I work as a DevOps, have been in a couple of companies in the last years. And I've been, uh, I'm particularly proud of my volunteer work that I've been doing with OpenMS, helping from CI, CD, and any sort of infrastructure that needs, that they need. But of course, you're not here to hear about me. You're here to hear about OpenMS. And OpenMRS is it's, uh, open, it's an open source medical record system. What is that? So when you go to a doctor, when you go to see a clinician, you, the, all the patient's data has to be stored somewhere, all the diagnosis, symptoms, and everything. So the first use of a medical uh, record system is to keep all the patient data. So when, when the patient comes back to the healthcare, all the data is already there, readily available for all the healthcare providers. Other thing that it can be used to is to support a, a healthcare decisions. So for example, you want to make sure a doctor does not uh, prescribe an X-ray to a pregnant woman without realizing that. So you can try to support all the healthcare uh, decision process. Other thing that it being used to is that if you, if, when you go to healthcare, you have different providers. You go to the lab, you get your exams, and you go to different yards, you talk to the nurse, and all these providers have to collaborate and have to talk. And a medical record system is something that can be used to that. Something that is not, for us, is not really clear is that after studies will be done with all the patient's data, with all the symptoms, the disease, what happened, what did not happen. So all these articles and studies are based on these. So having all this information available allows the, the academia to actually create these studies based on the things that happen on the population. And here you could see an example of what a clinician could see on a medical record system, like if they're trying to put the best allergies ever on the patient. And the other option that uh, we would have, instead of have an electronic version of it, would be paper-based. So you'd have the forms, and you'd have to fill them up and store that on your hospital. Then it'll be pretty much something like this, if it's like a real estate photo that you have. But in reality, it's more like this if you have a really posh hospital that everything's well taken care. But for me, it looks like more like out of nightmare to actually go all through all this paper, all this data just to collect. What, what happened with this patient on the past? So, but in this thing about OpenMS is that it, it's not the only one, or the first or the last medical record system ever created, but it's tailored for problems that occurs in third world countries, for diseases that are not, that are not common in first world countries. You're not going to buy a software that has uh, support for malaria because it's not popular, and it's not something that happens very often in a first world country. And the idea of OpenMS is started in 2004. What happened is that uh, Partners in Health, that is an NGO in the US, and Region Trade Institute, that is on the US as well, they are trying to create softwares for slightly different problems. So PIH was trying to create a software to aid HIV in, in Haiti, uh, HIV programs in, in Haiti and tuberculosis in Peru. And Region Street was trying to help aid HIV programs on Kenya. And what happens is that when you have healthcare programs, there is no single one solution fits all. They are all different, depending on the local guidelines, the local programs, how the local requirements, the laws, and all, how the programs and the skill and the professionals that you have locally. And at the time, there was nothing that would be flexible enough to be adapted to any need. So the idea about this, they did a partnership and they created kind of a healthcare platform. Instead of being something that you just install, it is a platform that it's a flexible data model that you can create any kind of healthcare system on top of it. Imagine it's like a framework that provides some functionality for healthcare systems. And it's all based in concepts. So depending on the, the, the kind of problem that you're trying to tackle, you can adapt it to anything you need. There is even, there was one that was even used for professional athletes. It's a very flexible data model that can be used to 
any kind of problem that you have. So today we have a very wide different community. And what happens is that on the top you have what is called the OpenMS platform. It's a Java application that provides very basic, it's, it does not even have a UI, it just provides very basic usability, very basic visitations and patients and other concepts like that. And then you have some implementations on top of that. So they take the core, the platform, they implement some UI, they implement all sort of features that they would need in that. So reference application would be something that you could adapt to a small clinic, and BAMI would be something that you would adapt to certain problems in hospitals. Not only that, you could, you, we have a lot of different local governments that implemented their own local version of OpenMS on their own country. So you have Kenya, you have Uganda, you have Mozambique, and probably four or five different countries that have been implementing their own versions. And they have their own local community. They own, it's a, a community inside a community. Not only that, there are several different uh, NGOs and non-profits that actually they re-implement a software based on OpenMIS to deploy to the clinic or anything that they are working on. And because of that, we have uh, several different places in the world using OpenMS. There are, uh, this data is from 2015. We have at least 1,800 sites, uh, clinics and hospitals and places using OpenMS, which is more than 6 million active patients. Uh, this is probably, this is bigger now. And because we are a medical record system, we do show up in a, we are cited in a lot of different articles in PubMed. So almost 200 articles are, are are sitting open MIS. PubMed is pretty much like Google for medical articles, if you don't know. And I think that because of that, this is a photo from our last conference. It was in Malawi in December. We have an annual conference. And we are a very diverse community. We, we have people from Asia. We have a lot of people from Africa. And you have developers from all around the world. And I think that being diverse is that what makes us so inclusive. And we are an actual nice community. We are very friendly. So, and that's something that it's not every community that is like that. And I really believe that where OpenMS shines is when it's deployed to remote areas, rural areas. But it's, it comes with its own challenges deploying to these remote places. So a lot of the, uh, the implementers that I talk about, they said the most difficult thing to deploy OpenMS, the, the most difficult, the, the biggest challenge that they have is actually having energy, having a power supply that is reliable. And sometimes they deploy things where they, they have the clinic, there is no power at all. Sometimes there are pow you know, powers a few hours per day, or if you get unlucky, it'll be, you have no power for two or three different days. And because of that, pretty much every OpenMS implementation adopts have on these places, they always have these all clinics powered by solar power. It's something that has to come. In some, some, people, some, some people were telling me that they cannot really use like real servers, real desktop servers. They have to use laptops because if the power goes down for one or two hours, it's fine. The laptop will be there working fine. There's several different implementers deploy it using tablets and laptops because of the unreliability of the power supply. The second problem to implement a medical record system is, is network, internet connectivity. That is something that you, we take for granted, but it's not on this place. If you don't have electricity, chances are you don't have internet. So in, diff in several different places, they actually, the only internet they can have is using SIM cards. And I discovered that in several different countries, even the providers, they, you can buy with the providers a, a service called RAN, Remote Access Networks, that is pretty much like a VPN of SIM cards. So you buy four SIM cards, they can only talk to each other, they are not connected to the internet, but they can, you have some limited connectivity. But of course, if you're using SIM card for all your networking connectivity or limited connect connectivity, you cannot just say, oh yeah, there is a meltdown patch, go there and update your operational system. There is no way of someone going and updating their Ubuntu or their Windows from one day to another. That, that is not a possibility. 
So I was asking, okay, how, how do you guys actually do secure pets? How does it work? And I think the best story was this guy that is saying he's NGL. They, every six months or a year, they take a youth, they go to this remote place, they take the server, they put on the truck on the back of the youth, they go back to the capital to apply patches. And then I decided I'm never going to comply about my patches being every weekend because the, this is so much harder. And because you have SIM card connectivity, you know how network work with phones. Sometimes if you're in this room, it works. If you go into the other room, you don't have connectivity anymore. So you have to find a spot on the clinic that actually has most of connectivity, but this is, has to be a hidden place because it cannot be, you know, on public view, otherwise it will be stolen. So you have to keep on, you have to find a specific, you have to go to the roof and find some spot that you have connectivity. And of course, you can't rely on that. It can go down for a couple of hours or more, depending on the weather and everything. And because, uh, and also, the, you see this photo in here? There is a cable on the bottom. That is called, that was, and I don't know if they improved it, the internet cable for half of the, the counter, a high T counter. So if you cut that cable, half a high T would not have internet anymore. So that is literally, you can cut the internet for high T in one single cable. And because we have so, such unreliable network, what happens is that different systems that connect to OpenMS are actually offline first. So you have a social worker that will go to the clinic, download all the data they need to their tablet, to their phones, then they go to the field, collect everything they need, and when there is connectivity back, when the person goes back to the clinic, this information is actually going to be uploaded. There are several other clients as well that are SMS-based, so you can update it using SMS. They are incredibly popular. Other thing that is I did not realize up front is that how hard it is to identify when a patient comes back to revisit. So here you say, what's your name, your date of birth? They can find if you're registered in the clinic or not. But reality is that in several different places, people have, they don't have birth certificate. They don't know the, their date of birth. They barely know their age, if you're lucky. And they, and even the concept of surname, it's changed depending on the country. In some places, in some tribes, people don't have surnames. Off they do, everyone has the same surname. So different implementations try to address this problem in different ways. Sometimes they try to give every patient an identification card that they have to bring back every time they go back to the clinic. That works most of the time, but some people go for photo or location, others or some similar concept. Or now they're trying to implement people when you, you read from fingerprint or iris scan to find out who is that person. But I was told for, from a guy from Tanzania, he is saying that not everyone wants to be recognized. Sometimes people get loss of care because they stop taking their medications for HIV. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and they don't want to show up and you know have to go all this process on psychologists to make sure they ex so they just give a fake name and there is no different they, there is no idea to prove that that person it, it's impossible to find out that that person is actually lying about their name sorry excuse me and i think with all that in hand you do realize that the world is extremely big. Things are so different than what you have in here. And you have, like, in these remote places, the patients, they walk hours to see a clinic, the closest healthcare provider. <coughs> so things have to be optimized for them to just see all the data. You can't just ask this patient to come back on the next day to get a lab result. You have to solve every problem that you have on the very same day. And when you have uh, resource constraint settings, it, it, efficiency is a must. You can't just drop everything that you have. You have to optimize it for all the res these constraints that you have. And most of the problems that are, uh, are happening in the third world countries, most of the crisis, they are treatable problems. It's not that we don't know how to treat HIV. It's not that we don't know how to treat cholera. 
they are a matter of scale. And I think we, as a human, a humankind, we have to prevent poverty as a cause of death. And that's what happens in these kind of places. And I believe that's, that's where software shines, that's where software makes a difference. You can optimize for the things that make a difference, the constraints that you actually have. Let me take on a little bit more water. So, for example, let me show you how, how software works on this kind of setup, how we can improve. To be, uh, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> so Partners in Health is an NGO in the US, as I was saying before. They, they, do, they do try to tackle the bigger challenges of healthcare in the world. They try to look for the challenges and they try to idealize what is going to be the best way to deliver, deliver that healthcare. In 2006, they decided to tackle the, the problem of tuberculosis in Peru. What happens is that Peru is, is a country in South America, in case you don't know. And one quarter of the population lives in poverty. And the, the amount of people suffering of tuberculosis is extremely high. And you have a, even a really high uh, incidence of more drug-resistant tuberculosis, which is an even more complicated type of tuberculosis. And the interesting thing in this case is that 60% of these people are living around the capital. So they are geographically very close. So PIH decided to tackle that. They said, and it was perceived by the academia at the time that tuberculosis was too hard to actually treat because the drugs are going to take at very least six months every day and they are extremely toxic. So you have side effects from deafness to psychosis or changing the color of your screen. In, uh, what happens is that PIH, they decide that the best way to deliver this care was other than create, of course, they create the clinics, they create the lab, they train the doctors, they work with the local government, they work with the local universities, but they decide to go to the community. So they went to the community, they found the health leaders, the, the leaders on the community, the volunteers on that, and they start training these people to identify tuberculosis symptoms, to understand the symptoms of every drug medication, to understand how to administrate these drugs, how important it was to come to the healthcare. And these people start working as proxy between the community and the healthcare. They managed to achieve one of the highest rates of success of tuberculosis in the world, which is 75% of uh, success in tuberculosis. And what I, I really like about this story is that, of course, you're talking about an army of people trying to get all this progress and everyone was trying to achieve that. And underneath all of that, there was one of the first implementations of OpenMS. The system connecting all the dots, the system connecting all these people that is doing all this work is actually implementing OpenMS, connecting all those things. And in 2006 as well, one of the first implementations of OpenMS, it was for this program, it, it's in Western Kenya. The, this program itself is started in 2001, and they were focusing on HIV care. Uh, Kenya, Western Kenya has one of the worst rates of HIV in the world. It's one in seven adults have HIV. And the thing about HIV is that it's a, a, uh, you have to have drugs every single day. You cannot stop the drugs. It's a regimen that you have to take for the rest of your life. And you have to have health care. Uh, you have to go to, to your health care providers every so often to make sure that the side effects are correct, the, the blood exams are on the right levels and everything. When you have these very remote communities where you have to work, uh, to walk hours to get to the healthcare, the incidence of dropouts uh, is extremely high. And the people that drop out, they actually become more, they, bec they, they can contagi uh, they can bring the disease to other people. So the idea about empathy was that they were trying to tackle this problem with a differentiated care. Instead of having a process that everyone has the same kind of care, and have to go to this pipeline to get the, the, your drugs. 
they decided to treat not the disease anymore, but treat the human being in a holistic way. So the human, the person, does not only has HIV, they actually have problems to, to have food. So they try to find out a way of providing food to this person. Today they actually have groups of uh, microfinance and things like that. But as you can imagine, right now they, have, uh, they, they are treating in the whole of Kenya more than 108,000 people. And you have a lot of the stuff to control of that is, is a lot of people. So in 2006, they asked the help of a registered institute to actually implement a software. And it was done on top of OpenMS. They are still using it to this day. They are still improving it. And when they implemented the software, they said that the clinic waiting was reduced dramatically. Because now people didn't have to wait for the staff to actually collect their file and everything. Things were a lot more streamlined. And now they could actually identify the patterns, the trends, like why are we having so many teenagers? How can we prevent this happening in the first place? You give the feedback back to the staff. What is happening on this program? How they can improve? How, where, where are the places that they are having more trouble? They are just not reactive treating the people that are already arriving. They are trying to understand on which communities are more affected and action than before that happens. Sorry. So between 2006 to 2010, there was a lot of different implementation of OpenMIS for different uh, for different programs, for different clinics for HIV and all the similar pro, uh, uh, systems. And PIH was already working on Haiti for a few years. And healthcare in Haiti was always complicated. And after the 2010 earthquake, the situation just got a lot worse because most of the hospitals were destroyed in the process. So PIH decided at, in 2010 that the best thing that it could do, it was create a full-blown hospital that would, there would be the tertiary care for the whole of central Haiti in Mirabilize. And it's, a, it's, it's pretty much what would be the version of Westmead, so it's a teaching hospital. It is, there, is 300 bad, uh, there are 300 beds in this. And because the power is unreliable as well, they had, you see everything on the roof, they're all solar panels because it's the largest hospital solar panel in the world. And when they have a surplus, they actually put on the national grid. So it actually improves the situation on the power in Haiti. It's a referral area for more than 3 million people. It, it, as you can imagine, when you have a whole uh, when you have to build a whole hospital, you have a lot of problems. You have first to design how it's going to be. You have all the stuff, all the surgeons, and all the process. And also, you have the software that is going to run to actually help all of that. And it was the first big implementation of OpenMS running on the hospital itself, not in a single program. And it was, uh, it was, I think, a completely different, uh, a, a different uh, experience because now you not only had you know, students or some people working in a certain program, you have staff that is working, you, know, you have to register everything. And so all the usability tests that you have to take, they are completely different. The clerk that is taking all the data, the receptionist when you check in the hospital, needs a completely different set of usability rules than the clinicians and the doctors and the nurse. And you have to keep adapting on that. And it was, uh, and, and in Haiti, uh, working in, in, with computers was, uh, was seen as a symbol of status. So people wanted to work on that, but they, they were not used to computers. So it was, I was told that they could not understand why the, their password would not work because they couldn't understand the concept of case sensitive uh, shift and caps lock. So they actually had to change the requirements for the receptionist because it was not the same requirements that you have for doctors. And it was, this hospital was inaugurated in 2011, a year and a half after the earthquake, a little bit more. 
And when it was inaugurated, uh, the developers realized there was a lot of new, uh, a lot of new clients and a lot of new patients with no visitations. So they, as if they arrived to the hospital, they gave their name, they, their date of birth and all their data, and they haven't seen a nurse, they haven't seen a doctor, they haven't seen a clinician. The developers got a little bit crazy. They thought the system was losing all their data and what are these visitation? And they contact the hospital. And uh, the, the staff were explaining to them that actually it was right. That's what exactly was people was doing. Because these people didn't have any piece of ID. So they would go to the hospital to receive the ID card so they can use it as a national card. And I think it was, it is, I think it showed the power of OpenMS because it was not only a system that you could use for national programs that, you know, to you know, specific diseases, you could actually use it to run a whole hospital in here. And another, um, another type of implementation in a hospital was in this, this is a small community hospital in rural India. So it was actually created in 1996. It was a society of health uh, professionals that they were in New Delhi. And they were pretty, they were, they decided to do something about the situation in rural India. What happens is that there are several places that there are no healthcare provider at all, or if there is, it's inaccessible for people from certain, for poor people, for certain tribes, or certain castes. And they decided that they had to do something about it. So they, they, they bought, they created this whole community hospital that today, it, it is a totally volunteer and not from profit. And what happens is that what they try to do is that to provide the healthcare as cheaply as possible for anyone who needs it, regardless of what is their gender or sexual orientation or cause or religion. And what, today they, they cover an area of almost 80 different tribes. They're pretty much the only healthcare provider that would be willing to, to, to take care of uh, these tribes. So people have to, when they want to go there, that's the only opportunity they actually have to have any sort of health care. So they walk there, they actually camp around this hospital so they can actually be attended. So you see here, this is the queuing system. So you put a piece of cloth of you on the, on the queue and then you, you can go to your tent again, you can go camp again, waiting for your, your time to be called in there. They aim to provide uh, any procedure of at least a, a top 10% of the cost that you would have anywhere else. So they have these amazing different uh, techniques that they, they come up with. So in order to test, for example, if the water is contaminated, they have this little paper with bacteria feed and they give it to the social workers. And of course, we're talking here about a place without electricity, without anything. And they, they instruct the social workers to take, take a, a, a bottle, glo a glass, a bottle of glass of that water, put the bad bacteria feed, and put inside the dress close to the body and walk with it all day long. So when they go work, they just collect the water in the, on the morning and they just walk with that all day long because it's warm. At the end of the day, they can take a look at the paper. If it's black, you should not drink that water. That is not a water that is good for the community. And they keep inventing all these kind of, 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 of different techniques to make sure that the healthcare that they provide is as universal as possible, as cheap as possible, so people can actually go there and actually pay for the healthcare. And of course, as you can imagine, they were doing everything, all the medical record system. It was all in paper. So uh, ThoughtWorks uh, India decided to help them and they created an implementation for them. It was called BAMI. Today it's a community open implementation. <coughs> and when they implemented, uh, it was in 2012. In 2012 when they implemented, it, it was, they were so happy because they said that the radiology, radiology lab 
took one or two hours less than usual to do all the work they need because they don't have to go all this paper, they don't have all this bureaucracy that was there before. And they actually had a spare time to do exams that there was, they never had the time before. So see, it, it, they, were, it, they had free time to actually do things that were not possible before. And I was talking to one of the main developers of FAMI, and he was telling that on, on the night of inauguration, and it, we are talking here about a very remote place, and of course there is no light. So they said that they had to put all this fire on torches around and on kind of the center of the, uh, the, the town. And they brought this kind of live goats and they killed the goats on the go and they did a huge barbecue and the whole community was so happy. And he thought it was the d most different party that he had ever been. And it was just five years ago. Another very interesting story about OpenMIS is uh, in Malawi. Malawi is one of the poorest countries in the world. The, they only spend at $59 per year per person in healthcare, compared to almost 5,000 that we, we do here. And in case you don't know, Malawi is over there in Africa. And we actually had our conference over that in, in, Jan, in, in December. Mal all the healthcare, the global, pro the national programs that you have in Malawi were, are done in using OpenMRS. So they have today 13 different implementations of OpenMRS tailored for each one of the programs that they have. And as far as I understand, there are a couple more in the go. So the mo every single, uh, national program they have is on open MRS. And we actually went to this hospital, and this is two clinicians on, on, the, on the right corner, and they were explaining, this is the AIDS, uh, the HIV program that she was showing. It works kind of a wizard for them, so they can do all the questions that they want, and it actually, it, it, she was saying that if you put the wrong doses, it will actually warn you, like, are you sure this children is a little bit older, a little bit heavier now, don't you want to increase? And she said it can avoid a lot of the common mistakes that you would have. And it actually allows you, it actually warns you about the possibility of the same person having tuberculosis, because it's a pretty common uh, thing that you have, you have tuberculosis when you already have AIDS. And it is, I swear this is the last one. <laughs> and in 2004, I suppose that uh, you probably remember the Ebola crisis that there was on, in several different countries, but in Sierra Leone it was particularly bad. So in Ebola crisis, several different NGOs around the world, they created the CDC's uh, Central for Disease Control, where the Ebola patients will be stay kind of a temporary hospital for Ebola patients. So um, in 2015, I'm sorry, in 2014, uh, ThoughtWorks Brazil decided to do a hackathon to create an open-mass version specialized for Ebola, to, for the requirements that the Save the Children CDC was, was asking. So Ebola treatment works in, you have two zones. You have the green zone where you just, you know, you were, that's where you have the doctors and everyone dressing, I don't know, normal clothes. And you have the red zone where you have all the patients in there. The thing is that when, you, when a doctor, a clinician or a staff enters the red zone, they have 40 minutes in there. That's all. You can't say more than 40 minutes. And you cannot take any paper out of the red zone. You cannot take pretty much almost no object. You have to disinfect anything that gets out of the red zone. So how do you know the, the clinicians on the, yellow, the red zone put this, something uh, on, the, on the patient record, record? They yell. There is someone on the green zone that is hearing and say, oh, this patient acts, this is the temperature, this is the symptoms. I cannot even imagine how hard it is to scream with all those scrubs that you have. So ThoughtWorks decided to do a version uh, for, for OpenMRS that would actually work, sorry, in tablets. 
So the people would, uh, in the red zone, they would have this, this tablet that would be waterproof. So they would disinfect the tablet. They put all the data on the tablet and would disinfect it before leaving that. And this is one of my favorite photos. This is the usability test that they were doing for that. Because when you're using the system, you have these big gloves, you have these, these goggles, and they are pretty hard to see. And it's, of course, it's hot, so you're sweaty. So it has to be an incredibly easy interface that you can do with the pen, and that's it. You can't use your fingers. You can't type anything you want. You, you, you can't remove your gloves to type anything. And after they did a hackathon, it was a two-day hackathon, people from five different countries volunteered to help finish it. And in two months later, they actually deployed to the CDC. It was in November 2014. And it was really good. The, the doctors loved it. They thought it was so much nicer to actually put you know, an information system instead of keep yelling. They could actually now talk to the patient instead of just keep yelling to someone on the green zone. Thankfully, uh, it was just running until February 2015 because the crisis was uh, averted uh, in Sierra Leone, so they closed the center. And this is a code that we do hope that we never have to use again. And all the, the, uh, if, if there is one thing that I think you have to realize in all these stories is that OpenMIS is not the star. OpenMIS is there to aid people, to aid the healthcare providers, to actually deliver the care that they need. The heroes are the doctors, are the local community that is actually running these programs. OpenMIS itself is not saving the world. It's helping the people that want to save the world. And I think that is really important to realize that in all the cases that it worked, it is a local community improving their community. It's not someone telling what to do. PIH provide all the resources and provide so many things and all the NGOs, they provide resources for the local community to handle the problems that they have. And I think that the whole point is to enable the healthcare providers to deliver the best care that they can. And I hope you like it, and that's all I have for today, and please join us. We are a very talkative community. We are very welcoming, and thanks so much. <laughs> do we have time? Cool. So, um, Do we have time? We actually do have time for a also, couple of questions. Um, I think that's just such an inspiring story about that is you know, only free software can do that, that it's, you know, actually can be deployed locally and adapted. Does anyone have questions? Um, yeah? And do you just want to repeat the question? Well? Yeah, so uh, he was asking about why, uh, what are, you know, uh, most of people you join a community because you, you want something that works, let's say, for you, some, some need that you actually have. In this kind of case, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to be using OpenMIS or how, how to get that. So we have two different types of people in the community. So you have all the people that are actually creating the implementations. They are either working for the government and creating the implementation. And or they are working on the NGOs that are deploying this kind of stuff. But you have randos like me that just, you know, I, I, I just thought, uh, I, I know it's personal and I, I can't answer for the others, but it is so good to be in a community that I know it's making a difference for, for you know, for the, the world is actually helping the people that actually it's not some, some profit that is given to big companies is something that is actually, of all the open source that I can remember from the top of my mind, is actually trying to make the world a better place. So I do believe that's where, you know, the core of people that are not directly working on that would say. Maybe uh, one more question.
Sorry, I don't. So I, th I think uh, the question is in developed country or like yeah, your wealthier how, countries. So usually you have, whoever is deploying it, it could be one of the NGOs. They actually have some people that are located to actually help. I suppose you ask from the operational's point of view. Yeah, so they do have, so it's not that on the clinic you have someone that is reciting the server when needed. There is someone behind it. So even when you have the RAN that people are just, you know, very remote, I, I, the, the, one, the person that is operational of so many of these, he said that on his phone he has a, a, one of those cards. So if he needs to SSH to a machine, he can actually do that. So it's kind of a shared model that you have a few operational people in NGOs that can actually cater for a lot of different clinics. Cool. I think that's all we have time for. And LCA would just love to give you a little present for giving you such a fabulous presentation. Thank you. And thank you very much, Cynthia. So I think there's a 10-minute break to move between um, sessions, and we'll have another session in here next. Um, but yeah, thank you.